we should continue talking about the prayers that are part of the assembly. We've been talking about the assembly as defined for us in Acts 2, uh, you know, 41 down to 42, where the church was first established and they uh, devoted themselves to four things, the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Um, and in each of these cases, the word the is used in the original language, which is how we know that it's a list of four things that they're doing. So we have spoken some about the teaching, we've spoken some about the fellowship, which includes the contribution, um, and we'll speak about the breaking of bread, um, but today we're talking about the prayers, the prayers, which is a thing that they are devoted to. One of the things the church did, that is the assembled saints did, was to be devoted to prayer, um, which is one of the things that comes up a little bit later in Acts 6 when the apostles realized that some of the physical needs were not being met. In particular, some of the widows were being overlooked in a daily distribution. And told the congregation, it's not right for us to give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. We're going to appoint seven husbands from among you to this matter, but devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So the apostles, if you will, in the off, in the in this sense, in the office of the elders of the church, are devoted to prayer and to ministering the word. The deacons are devoted to ministering uh, the needs of the saints. So, this is telling us that prayer is a work. Um, it's not, you know, the sole domain of the elders <laughs> by any means. But prayer is is work. It's effort. It's time. And so when we talk about how the assembly is praying, we're, you know, we're not necessarily talking about how you as an individual pray in private, wherever you may be, at home or whatever. We're talking about the assembly and the fact that Acts 2 said they were devoted to the prayers. So we got to define how did they pray as an assembly. One of these is what he said here, the, uh, the elders are devoted to prayer, and that's telling us that it's a work and it takes effort and time. And before we get into it, I want to present to you a warning in Matthew 6. The warning against vain repetition. Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8. When you pray, said Jesus, do not heap up empty phrases as the nations do. They think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Um, and this is not the, you know, I think very often people think of Catholicism and all the repetition, or sometimes they'll think of some of the Eastern religions with their chants and uh, meditation. There is that repetition aspect to it. That's true. Um, and it is heaping up empty phrases, but it's not either the sole domain of the Gentiles, as Jesus said. Don't do it this way. Don't be like them. That's because you could do it that way, and you could be like them. Uh, and so I would say, you know, we have to take a lesson from this, that we should pray, for example, we should pray for the sick. We have members of our congregation who are sick. Right? But we shouldn't pray for the sick. And for the sick. Give them health. And next topic. No. You need to be more specific than that. Right? That's the thing. Those are empty phrases perhaps. You have to beware the vain repetitions, and the way to do that is to be specific. I think the, the lesson that I took from this, from my own study of the matter, looking at these passages, bringing together how the assembly prayed, 
the lesson I take from this is that the answer to many of our problems, uh, whether that's a failure to pray as we ought or, um, you know, to pray in, in for things not appropriate, whatever it might be, the answer to these problems is specificity. What are you asking God for? Why are you talking to God? Um, vain repetition is a thing. Um, you got to ask for something specific. And we can get down to those specifics. It's not hidden from you. And we're not talking about being invasive of people's privacy or personal lives or anything of this nature. But you do have to be asking for something, and it has to be clear what that thing is that you are asking for. Right? This is what we're shown, or a conclusion I have drawn from these passages. So come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. One of the things, and it will also, we'll also go to Revelation, but um, one of the things that we are called to pray for is all people, the nation. That's a specific which goes down through 7, and I'd like to read it. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. First of all, I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, there is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He gave himself a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I, Paul, was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm telling the truth, not lying, a teacher of the nations in faith and truth. That's a one thought, actually. One through seven is one thought, don't stop at four. But it's touching on a number of things that I think we ought to look at. The church is commanded to pray for all people and all authorities. Where our prayers are, are supplications, you know, intercession, thanksgiving, on behalf of others. So even if the nation is not thankful about something, we give thanks on behalf of the nation. Um, if the nation needs intercession, we intercede on, on behalf of the nation. The things that are needed, uh, supplications, is things you're asking for, requests. But this is what the church is to do, is commanded to do this. Not just for authorities, but for all people with the intent, as he said, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, yes. Godly and dignified in every way, yes. But the bigger picture is this is godly because God desires them all to be saved. He's our Savior, but he wants all people to come to the knowledge of the truth, to be saved. But we pray for all people. We intercede and give thanks and... Um, make requests to God so that they may be saved, so that it may be according to God's will who desires that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, our prayers on their behalf do not supplant what the Lord is doing. There is one God, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So now you're not you're not overstepping your boundaries in this, and the church's prayers are not the same as the mediation of Christ. Okay, so there's no concern about overstepping or taking authority that is not yours or anything of this nature. But we do pray for people, we do give the benefit of the doubt, and even when situations are dire or for those who are even enemies of the church, we still pray for them. The church prays for it. And this is what Paul is appointed to. A teacher of the nations 
in faith and in truth. So God desires for them all to be saved. And if we want to be teachers of the nations the way that Paul is setting an example as a teacher of the nations in faith and in truth, well, we must also pray for the nations. How could it be that we're working on their behalf to help them to know the truth when we don't even pray for them, when they don't know how to pray as they ought? It's so the church is part of that. It's, it's part of the work of God to bring people to salvation and to knowledge of the truth. The prayer is part of that work. And in Revelation 5, 6 through 10, there is a scene in heaven where there is the lamb standing as though it had been slain. This is Jesus, obviously. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one seated on the throne. That's clearly God. And when he had taken the scroll, the, scroll, the four living creatures, 24 elders, fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This is a, you know, a spiritual passage. These are symbolic things, not literal things. But the symbolism, I think, is fairly clear. Golden bowls are bowls that were made for service of God in the temple. These are full of incense, which was burned in worship to God. But the incense is the prayers of the saints. So that's making rather plain that we're not talking about literal incense, literal hearts. It's talking about the worship that goes up to God and the prayers of the saints go up to God. And these who are in the heavenly throne room, whoever they are, sing a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals too. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. See, our mediator is worshipped in song and in prayer. The prayer is the incense that rises before the Lord. And he, by his blood, ransomed people from every tribe, language, and nation. We also are praying on their behalf. We are the kingdom and priests. We reign on the earth because we've overcome the world. We're not subject to the same fears that everybody else is subject to, the fear of death. Because we're Christians, we've overcome the world. We reign, we are the kingdom and priests. We reign in this world because we're able to help other people. We can pray on their behalf. God listens to us when we pray. It's not to say he can't hear the prayers of the unrighteous, but it's to say our prayers are definitely answered because we're ordering our prayers according to his will. And we pray on their behalf. We have that power. All right, so that's one specific. Another specific we talked about earlier, prayers on behalf of those who are sick. And again, uh, James 5, I think, is the right place to go for this. But again, you know, we are talking about being kind of specific about this. Um, that when you're asking for something, it should be clear what you're asking for. And and make that, make that known to God and, and seek that from God. And I don't say this because anybody is not doing it. Okay, so don't take it that way. I don't mean that at all. I'm just saying this is what I found in the text. Okay. James 5, 13 through 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick or deliver the one who's sick. The Lord will raise him up, and if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit.
that is the illustration that is intended to support the idea that you pray for the sick, that they be healed. Now, I realize that people um, usually say that this is about miraculous healing by the Holy Spirit. But, in fact, I find nothing miraculous implied or required for this passage to be understood. Uh, it's saying when somebody is sick, the elders come and they pray. We'll talk about the oil. But the prayer of faith will deliver the one who's sick. The Lord will raise him. Pray for one another that you may be healed. This is not talking about a miraculous healing where suddenly this person is yanked out of bed and is completely well. It doesn't say that. That's not what we're talking about. At least I don't think that's what they're talking about. Especially given that the example he's, he gives is the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. The reason for saying that is to indicate this is not miraculous. But the prayer really does help. So we're called on, you know, let the elders pray for them. Well, that's because the elders are dedicated to the spiritual work of the church. And in the first century, the elders are, are able to come and visit people. Um, you know, in, in, in our, wherever, whatever this is, that we, in our society today, <laughs> typically elders are not uh, fully supported by the church. And unless they are retired, they can't just come to you on any given day. Uh, they may come after work during the week, but whatever that is, They'll come, and they'll pray. It doesn't have to be just the elders. He's saying, if you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, sing. That's not a commandment. <laughs> Whenever you're cheerful, you must sing. It's required. Why aren't you singing? Your job is to be happy. Let me beat you with a stick until you are happy. No, that's not the requirement. <laughs> It's something that can be done. The elders can come and can pray for that person. But the church, obviously, is the office, if you will. I mean, if the elders are doing this, it's obvious the church is doing this. The church can pray for that person to get well. That is fine. Anointing him with oil, they say. Well, that is part of the miracle. Well, I, I don't read that anywhere. Um, I don't know where they got that idea, other than commentaries. But there's nothing in Scripture that shows that anointing with oil was part of working miracles. Um, this is just what people did when somebody was sick, to help them feel better. Uh, years ago, I took a trip to Taiwan, and I got on China Airlines at that time. I think they were friendlier. I'm not sure. But um, one of the things that they did that was very different... Um, there are a lot of different things about that flight, but uh, one of the things they did that was very different was they would come around with a pair of slippers and uh, towels that were warm and had some kind of alcohol or something in them so that you could wash your face and your hands and your feet if you so desired, but what, you know, that it felt good. People were like putting them on their forehead or covering their face and laying back and stuff. It felt really good. And I realized, oh, yeah, this is like anointing him with oil. <laughs> They're just doing something that helps you feel better. And if you've ever rubbed, you know, Vicks Vapo Rub on your child, you have anointed him with oil. Because <laughs> that's the basis of that stuff is oil, grease. It's, that's what you're doing. Um, it doesn't require a miracle. It does require, you know, being there, uh, bringing something, uh, thinking about them, praying for them, touching them. Uh, these are all part of what it takes for people to get better. 
And so the elders can pray for the sick. The church can pray for the sick. It says the prayer of faith will deliver one who's sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. That's an interesting note, and I, I didn't expand upon this, really, but you can compare it to uh, 1 Corinthians 11. He said, uh, you know, those that are partaking in a way that's not right. For this reason, many of you are sick, and some have died. Um, it's possible sometimes that illness has beset us because of something we've done wrong. And in this case, you know, if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. We are, our prayer for one another. And it compares as well with 3 John uh, 2, where John says, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Which tells us that we pray for the soul as well as for the body, for good health. It is okay to do this. All right. So that's kind of specific. We also have specific prayers on behalf of the work of God. So in Romans 15, you have Paul saying to the church that with their prayers, they strive together with him. Meaning they're, they're wrestling, working alongside him. They're part of this fight. He said, Romans 15, 30 to 32, Brothers, I appeal to you by the Lord Jesus and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. So again, prayer is striving together. Uh, the assembly, you know, we, the saints, are part of one another. We are members of the Lord's body. We're, we are part of one another. And so our prayers are to be striving together. We work together. You know, I don't preach the gospel alone. You preach with me when you pray for the teaching and pray for those who are to hear it. Right? And our class teachers are not teaching alone. They are joined by our prayers on their behalf and on behalf of their students. We're striving together. But when we talk about specifics, you know, here's why I said there's specifics. Look what he said. Pray for me. That I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. That my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints that by God's will I may come to you with joy, and that I may be refreshed in your company. Understand that G the Paul, um, th this passage tells us plainly that he is incarcerated in Jerusalem at the time that this is written, because he has appealed to Rome, he hasn't gone up to Rome yet, but he's coming. So the prayer is, or perhaps he's on his way to Jerusalem, knowing that chains await him. But somewhere in that time frame. So he said, first of all, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. So the prayer would be, Father, you deliver Paul from the unbelievers in Judea. Let no harm befall him. Right? The things of this nature is what we would pray. Service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, as in let the, the saints in Jerusalem accept the charitable support that has been sent to them from all the nations through the hand of Paul and those who are with him. But let that be acceptable to them. Let them receive this and give thanks and good come from it, right? Let Paul come to us with joy, Rome might pray. Because, you know, he'll be traveling um, in chains, incarcerated to Rome. But let him do so with joy. It is knowing what he's coming to, that the saints are there and that he loves them and they love him. And that he be refreshed. Allow us to keep Paul company. Which is not a given since he's going to be in jail in Rome. That's the prayer. 
it's kind of specific, you say. Well, yeah, but he's an apostle. Well, yes, but he wrote this down for you and for me to understand. And so we also pray for that work, that the truth gets forth out of Judea, despite the opposition from the ruling party of religion at the time. That the work that was done in in bringing all of this money together to help the saints in a time of famine works out well. That, you know, that God's apostle, Paul, can be safely transported to Rome and continue to do the work there. These are things that we pray for as the church. We also pray on behalf of those who are doing the work. And you say, well, I thought that's what Paul said. Yeah, I understand. And, you know, you had to make a break somewhere and, you know, get your own lesson if you're going to be like that, you know. <laughs> Acts 12 um, is one place where we are being specific about praying on behalf of those who are doing the work. In this case, in Acts 12, uh, about that time, Herod laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. And it did please the Judeans, so he did some more of it. Peter, in this way, was kept in prison, verse 5 tells us, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And you remember, perhaps, and if you don't, you can read it. It's in Acts 12. That God delivered Peter from jail. <laughs> he came and knocked at the door while they were all inside praying. And I'm like, who is it? <laughs> Well, you could have known it was Paul. No. But still, or I'm sorry, that it was Peter. Excuse me. But still, they were praying for him, and that's fine. Paul's in prison. They prayed for him to get out of prison. And he did, and he lived beyond this and was able to write First and Second Peter. They probably had already written First Peter by this time, but he was able to write, finish out Second Peter. Okay. And then in Philippi, um, you know, Philippi supported Paul. They're the only ones who sent support to him while he was traveling in Greece. So he tells them in Philippians 1, 12 to 13, I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So he's in Rome. He's in jail at Rome. This is telling us also that the Roman prayer that we read about was answered. He did come to them in safety. He was able to meet with the saints. The gospel has become known throughout the imperial guard. My imprisonment is for Christ. They understand it. So though he's in jail, he said, I want you to understand what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. The 18th verse continues, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Which is true, and that's true in our day too. I mean, I understand that the many churches that are out there cannot be the church that belongs to Christ. Christ has only one church, but at least... They are naming the name of Christ, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. It's true, it's better to be in a country where people say that they are Christians, even when they are not, versus a country that is atheist or some other thing where you may find yourself at the end of a bayonet for being a Christian. So in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, he said, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it's my eager expectation and hope that I'll not be at all ashamed, but with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. But did you see here? I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. Their prayers are solicited at Philippi. You are praying for me, and I know this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope I will not be at all ashamed. With full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored 
in my body, whether by life or by death. So if he gets out of prison and is able to teach again, that's glorifying God. He will continue in the flesh. And how is it, you know, perhaps you would say, how is this glorifying God in the body? Well, you remember the kind of preaching that Paul does, <laughs> how he ends up stoned to death, dragged out of cities, you know, let down the wall, uh, shipwrecked, how many horrible things happen to them. So yes, that's in the body. Or if Rome executes him, which history tells us is what happened, he nonetheless is not ashamed. He nonetheless has full courage and that the answer, the prayer of the church is answered that Christ be honored even if by death. So we pray and we pray kind of specifically about this. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Right. So yes, we pray and we pray kind of specifically about the things. And that, I think, is the important, to my mind, that's the easiest way to remember how to do this appropriately. Um, we're asking God for things, and he listens to us. We are his children in this world. The nations don't know what to pray for or what to ask for, as they should. We do know, and we pray to benefit them as well, on their behalf and whatever else might be going on, and we pray for one another. So it is important, you know, I, there is privacy, I know, and there's individual lives I understand that, and that's fine, but balance that with the need um, that is the church needs to pray for its membership. Like we, we need to know each other. I remember, uh, always remember one of the older sisters at Woodmont in Fort Worth who would talk to me whenever I would visit while I was in college and, and ask what's going on in your life and what what are you thinking about and what's happening, you know. At some point, I would feel like I was, you know, just bending her ear too long. And <laughs> and she said, no, don't, don't stop telling me, because if I don't know what's happening, I don't know how to pray for you. And it stuck with me. I realized this is true, actually. She was a good woman, and I think she, her husband had been a preacher, but she had been a widow many years by that time. But um, what she said is true. If I don't know what you need, how can I ask for it? Um, and don't you want me to go to God on your behalf in prayer? Um, not taking the place of the Lord, I understand that. I'm no mediator, I'm not perfect. Uh, but Elijah had a nature like ours and prayed. We can pray in justice. We can pray in faith, as he said, knowing that good will come of this. Uh, as Paul said, whether by life or by death, there's no guarantee of a miracle. Um, there's no guarantee of any specific physical outcome. But we pray, and God's will be done, and benefit come, one way or the other. Um, so, maybe that is a useful thing. I hope that it is. When the church prays, we pray for our governing authorities. We pray for uh, the people who are around us. We give thanks on their behalf. We intercede on their behalf. We um, make requests on their behalf for everybody. But especially for the saints that assemble in this place. Let us help one another in these things. Paul's example of glorifying God by life or by death, is our example to you. That, that's for us, that we are to give our lives to God. If today you are not a Christian, you have not given your life to God. And you're not glorifying him as he ought to be glorified. Now, everybody does glorify him in the sense that his will is going to be accomplished. Even evil people have a role in the plan of God, and that glorifies him in some sense. But that's no way for you to live, and that's no eternity that you want to spend. If you today are not a Christian, become a Christian, become a child of God. Put 
the Lord first in your life. Make a permanent change of heart, which is repentance. And put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of your sins, where his blood washes away every wrong thing. And in that blood you have an agreement with God, a vow that you make to him to be faithful to him from here on. We're glad to help you to obey the gospel if that is your need. If you are a Christian who has not lived right, let us help you with our prayers on your behalf. We were just talking about the effectiveness of the prayers of the saints, and it is true, and we need it. We pray for the people. There's not somebody else. This is the church. We are the assembly. So let us take hold of our responsibility and our privilege and address our Father in prayer. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, let that need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.